QK time. Welcome to today's live market analysis session with me, Patrick Munley. And um, just quickly before we get started here, if you can hear me and you can see the tick mill welcome screen, could you type a Y in the chat box? Good stuff. Okay, let's, uh, let's get going. So before we, uh, we jump into today's material, as always, <coughs> we want to pay attention to the risk disclaimer, which uh, firstly informs us that uh, trading any financial instrument carries an inherent amount of risk and we can lose more capital than we necessarily have on deposit. And secondly, and most importantly for today's discussion, uh, mater the material and opinions expressed by me today are solely mine. They are not representative or indicative of those held by Tickmill UK Limited or Tickmill Europe Limited. Now that we've covered that off, um, before we get going with the, the charts and the analysis, a uh, brief introduction to me. Um, like I say, my name is Patrick Munley. After I graduated from King's College London, I joined a city PLC consulting firm. I ultimately left there with some colleagues and went on to successfully co-found and exit a consulting startup post a merger in late 2004. I then moved on to explore my passion for markets. Uh, so with some capital to play with and some time on my hands, I started uh, day trading the S&P 500. After some early beginner's luck ran out, I experienced a significant six-figure financial hit. It was at this point I decided to get serious about trading and sought out a mentor who uh, demonstrated excellence in the field of trading. I worked with this mentor for 18 months to two years. It was a period during which I upped not just my uh, technical game in terms of developing a trading strategy, uh, researching it, developing extensively back testing and forward testing, um, all of which was underpinned by a rigorous risk management strategy. Um, most importantly during this period of mentorship though, I significantly developed my mental game and probably most importantly there, I made the watershed shift from being a highly goal orientated uh, individual focusing on financial gains to being purely process orientated. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means I had to stop focusing on what I could make from the markets and start focusing solely on managing my mindset to allow me to consistently execute my trading strategy. Oftentimes in the face of negative feedback from the markets in the form of losing trades. But once you become process orientated and have a professional trading mindset and you really understand and accept the true nature of trading, i.e. it being a numbers game in which you are simply playing probabilities, you then lose the emotional investment and that hellish emotional roller coaster of living and dying by the outcomes of individual trades. I'm no longer concerned with the outcome of individual trades or even strings of trades. My focus is on the next hundred trades because I know if I focus on excellence in execution, my edge will demonstrate itself over an extended series of outcomes. Uh, my multi strategy approach has delivered profitable annual returns since 2008. Uh, the results you can see on the screen are from 2013 when I started managing investor capital through a managed account service, delivering annual positive returns. I'm currently responsible for managing a multi-million dollar portfolio, which has grown organically from my capital, like I say, to managing investor capital. And on the screen at the moment, you can see the trading data here. And like I say, I'm looking at an extended series of outcomes. So I do experience losing months, losing trades, multiple losing months. But because I keep consistently executing my strategy, ultimately I come out on top. And the most important data for me here is really um, this data down here in the corner. So an average winning month for me is 7.85%, and an average losing month is 2.35%. So if you extrapolate that out, you can gauge that on average I'm making two to three times what I lose. And as long as I keep those metrics in place, and then I know that over the, uh, over the, the longer term horizon, I'll continue to, uh, to be successful. Um, since 2010, I've also personally mentored over 100 private traders of all experience levels, from uh, complete novices to former CME floor traders, in developing the technical and mental skills to reap consistent returns from the markets. I've also consulted to numerous brokers and trading education brands, uh, contributing written 
content, webinars and live presentation content on a range of topics from market analysis to trading strategy development and execution. In addition to my fund management responsibilities, um, I'm also a resident market expert for Tickmill, providing a daily market analysis and trade analysis. You can access that through the Tickmill blog, or you can even sign up to receive notifications of the posts and they can be uh, sent to your inbox. Uh, my only other project and really a passion project for me is as the head of trading and tra trading education for a leading retail trading development firm, trading education firm called FX Career Swap. We offer development and funding to retail trading talent. Um, at FX Career Swap, we don't just develop retail traders, uh, market and trading strategy knowledge. We work extensively on mindset development and through our structured program that culminates uh, through to managing the firm's capital at zero personal financial risk on a profit share basis. Um, for those that are interested, I will, uh, I'll post a link in the chat. We actually have a 14-day um, free trial for those who are uh, interested in learning more about that opportunity. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, now let's jump into uh, some of the uh, off the chart stuff that I like to, to take a look at. As, uh, as we've just started a new month, we, uh, we should check in with the seasonals. So on the screen at the moment, you can see seasonal patterns over the last 20 years for the major financial instruments that I track. Um, I don't use this information really as necessary to, to engage or, or, or enter trades, um, but certainly I use it to help uh, in terms of if I do get a signal from one of my strategies and if, that, if seasonals sync up, then I will uh, I'll oftentimes try and ride that trade to, uh, to increase returns. What we can get a sense of here, at least through um, the next couple of months, is that there are some, there's a potential for the dollar um, to have a, a brief, what I think is going to be a brief, uh, brief pause in, in its negative sentiment, and we can potentially see a correction, uh, as identified here by these green squares, um, suggesting a positive period for the dollar. We can see slightly weaker periods here for the euro, uh, the Japanese yen, uh, the British pounds, uh, not so much. Australian dollar, a little bit stronger, but um, really the, the, the idea for me at the moment or, or what I'm looking at is the, the potential for a near-term, and I say near-term, dollar correction. And that potentially then will feed into a pullback in terms of some of these risk, uh, risk markets, uh, specifically the S&P. For those who weren't here last week, just briefly, this is a, um, a seasonal chart of the S&P 500, uh, all election years at the, uh, down here since 1950 and up here since 1995. This is the uh, current market, uh, the 2020 market overlaid. And you can see that um, from a seasonal perspective, we often see a top in the S&P 500 in advance of, um, of the elections, which are on November the 3rd. And more often than not, we see a low then occur. Um, and so I'm tracking, I'm watching at the moment some patterns that are developing in the S&P. We'll look at the actual chart in a minute, which uh, suggests to me that we could be starting to see uh, the initial phases of this pullback develop. Um, here we have a, uh, an interesting uh, chart from uh, uh, Crescent Capital. They have just done an overlay here of financial conditions. So this means off Wall Street, basically, the actual um, main street, what the financial conditions are for the average American versus where the S&P 500 is. And what, we're, what we get a sense of here is that when financial conditions make meaningful lows highlighted by these yellow circles, we tend to see some type of near-term correction in terms of the markets. Now, sometimes this has been a significant correction, as in the dot-com boom and bust and the uh, GFC, uh, 2008-2009 um, and so it's interesting to note that we are seeing these uh, financial conditions uh, really suggest that we could see a, a potential pullback develop in terms of the, the broader S&P 500 at the moment. Um, I've highlighted last week the issues we've got with breadth in the market, so breadth as referenced stocks that are advancing versus stocks that are declining versus the overall market. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the NASDAQ uh, we rolled over significantly in breath. The last times we've, the, the prior times when we've seen this, we have actually seen the markets pull back and NASDAQ obviously has been on a tear. And so we want to watch that. 
as this breadth continues to decline, the impact that could have in the near term on the markets. Uh, finally, here we have the, um, the S&P 500, uh, 500 versus the New York Stock Exchange advance and decline. And you can see we're getting some divergence up here as the S&P has made its most recent highs. Um, one other chart that I just want to draw your attention to here is um, this is the aggregate net speculative positioning um, versus, uh, for the US dollar. And you can see here we're actually making significant lows at the moment in terms of the stretch. So this means that the, the market is heavily short uh, the US dollar at the moment. And more often than not, when the boat gets loaded on one side, we tend to see a correction or a pullback at least. And so this um, brings me into uh, the, the dollar view that I have at the moment where I see the potential. Uh, I'm not suggesting it's gonna be anything particularly meaningful at this stage, but certainly potential for a pullback. And um, what we're gonna do this week as we, uh, when we first jump into the charts now, is I'm going to run you through some cycle or fractal analysis. Um, this isn't something we've done before in these sessions, but I think it will be useful for you guys in terms of broadening your scope of understanding of how markets um, potentially function. And um, here is the dollar index chart. And uh, if we just scroll this out a bit, you'll see it more clearly. And this is versus the decline we saw in 2017 over here. And these boxes basically replicate um, similar phases of price action versus our current phase. Now what's important with this stuff is that um, whilst the markets have a tendency to, uh, or, or let's, actually we, we, everyone probably knows the phrase, history doesn't necessarily um, repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And the reason for this is that the market is ultimately made up of human beings who have a tendency to act in a similar fashion given a similar set of circumstances. And so what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is we saw the advance into the high in December um, 2016, the advance into the high here, uh, March 20th. And then we saw the initial move off the lows, uh, uh, sorry, the initial move off the highs. And then we saw this corrective period we saw a similar corrective period here uh, in May of this year. We then broke down out of the corrective zone as we did here. And then we pulled back to a test of resistance area. And then we saw a protracted move, what we can refer to as the waterfall or impulse move. And that would bring us back down into this low here. At the moment, we, we are correcting. And this correction, to my mind, if we just blow this up a little bit, get a sense of what's going on. I think we could be in this phase here now and see a, uh, a correction before uh, another low develops um, into, into September. And this, this low that, that I, I think will develop into September should broadly coincide with a potential top coming in with the S&P 500, but we'll see. This, this low could represent this low. What you can get a sense of here is what the potential then is for a corrective move. And if, it, if, if we continue to track the 2017 market map, and like I say, we're not necessarily going to be tracking every level specifically, but what we're talking about is the fractal nature. So the, the overall price pattern, the shape of the price, and how we can start to see how that could develop and where the opportunities may lie. So the distinct opportunity for me at this stage is gonna be one, looking for a tradable low in the dollar, um, and I'm currently long the dollar um, in my accounts, and I'll talk you through that when I look at specific setups in a minute. But what I'm looking for is this correction into, um, or certainly to get it back into that 94 or as high as 95.50 here. And then what I see is the potential for the, fight, the, the ultimate waterfall move down, which will actually bring us back into that 88.40 area. So this is, this is just a form of market mapping, which allows you to get a sense of the scope and scale um, for moves in the market. So that's the dollar index. So now if we think uh, in terms of the euro, and the euro is the biggest constituent of the broader dollar index. So that's why we, we want to see how the patterns overlap and how they track in terms of the euro. So you can see, made a low, uh, we got a, a move off the low, that uh, an overlapping move, similar to the overlapping nature of the price action here. This is the accumulation phase, they refer to it. And, uh, and then we get this break higher, consolidation, 
just prior to the highs, consolidation just prior to the highs. And then we get that impulse move higher, which we've seen. And now we're consolidating here. And I think, uh, and again, once we start to look at the, um, at the charts in a second, the actual uh, trading charts, then you'll see where I think the opportunity is. But certainly if we get a pullback into um, the 117 area, you can see then we would have the scope to make a move up into this 122 area before getting a pullback, which then I think will give the, the setup um, for the move up into this 125, 127 area um, that I talked about previously on the weekly charts. If you, have, if you weren't in prior sessions, I suggest you uh, go back over some of the previous weeks where I've looked at the weekly and the monthly charts and, um, and you'll see, uh, I can actually post the link here for you, I think. There's a link there um, which will allow you to access the recordings and you can uh, and you can get a sense of what I'm talking about with respect to the uh, the weekly setups, the symmetry swing moves. I actually can draw it in for you here. So we, uh, we use the trend based fib extension tool. So we have this point here, to this point here and from here. So we actually have the potential to expand higher here in an equality move up to the 128. But certainly we'd be looking for 126.45 as an ultimate objective for this cycle. Okay. Does everyone follow along with respect to what I'm talking about here in terms of this, the fractal nature of the market? Is, is that making sense? If you type a Y in the chat box, if, uh, if you're all still with me. Good stuff. Okay, so uh, let's look now at some, uh, some of the actual cycles in some of the other pairs. So here's the sterling. And, um, and I've overlaid a, an Elliott Wave camp here. Um, again, I don't, uh, I don't live and die by Elliott Wave, but where I can see patterns um, that are obvious to me, then I certainly will track those. I think we're in a stage now with the, uh, the sterling where we could see a pullback here to test, a third test. Uh, and these are ones that I certainly track. But this ascending um, trend line support. So back down to this 129.70, 130 area. And then that would complete an interim um, five wave cycle, uh, which would set up then an equality objective from that 130 up as high as 141. Um, and then so we've got to think to ourselves, well, what could be uh, the catalyst to drive that move? Well, we likely see a wobble um, in the, heading into the end of September, where we've got the, the Brexit negotiations. And as we know with this, or, or as I, through experience, know with this, uh, this type of stuff, what we tend to do is we tend to hear a lot of hard talk just prior to the, uh, the final deadline, which is uh, September the 30th. And that hard talk it tends to uh, deliver a corrective move. And then what we tend to get is a last minute deal, which makes everyone look like they've got something they needed or, they, or they've, they've, all, they've all done a great job in terms of driving a deal. And so if that's what's gonna play out here, you can see, even if we think in terms of time, that's in this, uh, from a time horizon perspective, depending on how we trade here, this, this test could come in around the end of the month. And then we get that deal. And if we do get a deal that's received warmly by the markets, then Sterling could take off and we could see a big 10 figure move here. And what would that mean? Well, if we go back to the, the dollar, um, dollar chart that we were just looking at, um, well, that would coincide with Sterling, cor the correction in Sterling coming up to here. And then we get that waterfall move, which would see Sterling back up at that 141 level. Does that make sense? So we get sterling correcting as we get the correction in the dollar. We test the trend line support. If, we, you know, if the buyers step in here, we get a deal, then we could see a big move in sterling and that would drive that, uh, the potential for that dollar decline that I've just talked about. So let's take a look at the Aussie. Aussie is in a slightly different stage. I think we're, we're coming to the completion of its five wave here. And I think we're going to see a, a, a bit of a pullback in terms of the Aussie, which again would broadly coincide with um, the pullback that I anticipate we'll see in terms of uh, the dollar and risk sentiment in general. We could still see one more high here um, in terms of the Aussie to, to test the equality objective 
at the 74.60 level, but we're seeing a bit of weakness at the moment. If we take out the trend line support, then, uh, then I'd say all bets are off there. And I think we, we're probably going to look at a move back down to test support towards the 67.68 area. But again, just mapping a potential Elliott wave um, scenario here that fits pretty nicely. If I, I should have marked that one up here. Let me do that now. So we've got an end. We've got the major cycle, and then we've got this final, uh, final leg here. We've got one, two, three, four, and then we'll have this. Well, this is either going to be our fifth, or if we um, if we do get uh, get this final move, then we can see this is our fourth, and this is our fifth, and we, really the trend line will define that for us. Um, but certainly, then I think we're coming into a, a tradable high in terms of the Aussie and a, a correction. So really want to focus on how we trade as we, uh, as we come in to test this trend line in the Aussie. Like I say, I'm, I'm short the Aussie at the moment. Um, and finally, the, uh, the S&P here, I posted this today as the, as the chart here. I think we've got a pullback developing here in the S&P. Um, this is a this big broadening top pattern potentially developing. Um, we have, obviously we've got the seasonal factors driving the potential for a pullback. And then we've made this test, third test of this trend line. We couldn't close above it yesterday and today we're seeing some weakness creep in. Like I said, if we get a close below um, 35.27, then I think we're heading in, in pretty short order um, down to 3,400. But I don't think that's the end of this cycle necessarily. We could then see um, one more high play out and possibly um, just take out the, the highs of this triangle 36 uh, into that 36 area before then we see a more meaningful pullback. But certainly I see a tradable pullback developing in the S&P 500 and really want to pay attention to, uh, to where we close today and do we close back below this trend line with a tweezer top. And certainly if we've got an outside reversal, then I'd be happily short the S&P uh, initially to retest that 3,400 area, which, you know, it doesn't look anything massive on the chart, but it's, uh, it's 120 points in the S&P. And depending upon your trade size, that's a meaningful sum of money. Um, so keep an eye on that level in the S&P today, 35.27, and the potential for a, uh, for a tweezer top to develop in the S&P. Okay, let's look uh, now at just some of the uh, nearer term opportunities. Sorry, I should have mentioned at the start, guys, um, once I've gone through the charts, or the charts I'm looking at anyway, I'll open it up for questions. And if you have a chart you want me to take a look at, you can just type it into the, the chat, or you can... Um, Raise your hand and I can unmute your mic and you can, we, you can speak to me if you want. Um, so dollar index, trying to put in a, a low here, a tradable low. Uh, we had this sending trend line support here and we had this uh, bullish positive divergence and we've got that pin bar and we've, we're trying to make a move here. Uh, like I say, if we can get something going, um, then we could see 94.60 or the descending trend line um, resistance area. Or um, if we if thinking again in terms of the fractal, we might it might be that we, you know, we, we're having to make another low. So if we just go back to that in terms of the boxes, you know, it could be um, that you know we're gonna make one final push here down into the uh, into the 91 area. We don't know that at the moment. We can only trade what we can uh, what we see on the charts. And so at the moment, we've got triple divergence and we've seen some buying step in and some short covering. Let's see if we've got, a, we've got a trend line here now coming in. So we're just testing this trend line. If we can get through there, that could be interesting. We certainly could see that move higher. But if we can't here, we roll over, then we get that move down to the 91.29 area that I've just referenced. And then we'll reassess uh, the price actions we trade there. Um, Swissy is a trade I've got on at the moment. Um, posted this as... Uh, trade of the day, similar pattern obviously to the dollar index. So, uh, the Swiss franc is a component of the dollar index. Um, not seeing, not seeing as, mu as much as a, a push higher here at the moment. The reason for that is it's being um, pressured by the fact that we're seeing Euro Swiss uh, weakness because of the Euro weakness we're seeing. But technically the trade still stands. It's an outside reversal, taking out the prior, two prior days ranges. Bullish divergence. Psych indicators is just trying to tick bullish here. Um, and we're battling at the moment with, uh, with this trend line and looking to see really if we can get a close above there. And that, uh, that, should set up, that could set up a move then to test this 93.60 uh, 93, area prior breakdown point is what, uh, what I'm looking at. 
uh, euro. So I'm short the euro from, uh, from this uh, pin bar reversal with the, uh, trip, again, triple divergence developed. And, um, and I, what I'm looking for here in the euro, like, like I was just talking about in terms of the, uh, the setup, the, the, the fractal setup, if we can get a test into this trend line here, the 1716, then certainly I want to pay attention to how we trade here. Because if we hold <coughs> this area and we get some bullish reversal patterns, then I see the, um, certainly see the scope for us to make that next leg higher before we see a more meaningful correction. So this is the type of pattern I'll be talking about. Up into the, the trend line from there, and then we could see something, uh, something more significant develop in terms, of, uh, in terms of the euro dollar, again, before that next significant leg, high, uh, leg higher. So watching how we trade here, if we get into this area, if we get a bullish reversal pattern, then certainly I'd, uh, I'd consider reversing my current short position and I'd be targeting 122 as the next leg to the upside. Euro yen, posted this one today <coughs> as chart of the day. I was looking for the trend line to break here. Maybe we're not, that's not gonna happen now. And this is why we wait for the candle closes, price confirmation before getting in. But if we hold here, then we could be back up here like so. And what would we get? Well, we'd have the third test of the ascending trend line, or it could be a, a, an ending diagonal type pattern here. We've certainly got significant divergence down here in play, which is like what, which is what we like to see. So any move up into this 127.50 with bearish reversal patterns. Again, I think that would be a shorting opportunity, and we could have uh, we could have a nice pullback, looking always at these symmetry swing areas. So bring us back into these prior highs here at the 122.50 uh, zone would be my my objective if um, if the pattern plays out. So it'd be this type of move. Uh, Sterling Aussie is another one that I've got on at the moment. Um, posted this chart in the, uh, as I think it was a chart hit or trade of the day. Um, but I see the potential for an inverse head and shoulders here. Bags of divergence as we made that last low. And what I'm looking for is just a corrected pattern, simple A, B, C, D or um, an A, B, C if you're into Elliott Wave. Um, but again, I mean, if, you, if you're not in this trade and you, you want to take a look at it, there's certainly opportunity to, um, let's get rid of this. Certainly opportunity to, uh, to put a long position on through that uh, 182.35 handle, get a nice, uh, nice risk reward, 181.49 tens of a stop and the target is up here at uh, 187.73. So if, you, if you're interested in that trade, those are the type of parameters I'd be looking at using uh, the Aussie, like I say, short the Aussie at the moment. Um, got a little tweezer top up here at the top. We had, again, we had triple divergence. We kind of just taken out um, the ending diagonal, which oftentimes happens where they just run the stops and then reverse it. And um, you can see now, certainly scope down to the 72 area, where again, going back to that, going back to the, the cycle that I'd identified, you know, this could be where we, we, we stall out for a final run at, um, at 75 before then making a more um, significant rollover. But if the, if these, if watching the S&P, um, if the S&P starts to make a move to the downside here, it'll take the Aussie with it. And so, um, so I'm happy to, to hold short positions for now in the Aussie. Another one I'm looking at for this evening is the Kiwi. We got that third test of the ascending trendline resistance. We're getting a potentially going to see a close here below the near term volume waste average price, which is the, the, a signal for me. And uh, what have we got? Well, triple divergence. We've got the RSI stochastic rolling over from extreme levels. So again, you know, looking here, you could be looking at 67.10 as an entry, depending upon where we close. And we could be trading down at 65.50 in quite short order. You get a relatively tight stop above the price cycle highs there. And last, I don't know, I've got a couple of, oh, yeah, copper. Um, and this could be driving these commodity trades at the moment. We're seeing copper roll over a bit here. Again, divergence. We're into, uh, into this ascending trend line resistance. As you can see, we could have this type of ending diagonal pattern. Obviously, pay attention to the 290 level if we uh, see follow through below the weekly pivot here. 
down to 290. That could be support, but it'll be the fourth test. And more often than not, when you get a fourth test of a trend line, it will, uh, it will erode it and it will break down. So, I mean, we could be, uh, again, thinking in terms of opportunity, it could be that we're starting to, uh, to see the potential for a more meaningful correction in copper here. And if we see that in copper, then we can think in terms of the other risk markets and, um, and what the potential can be in terms of corrective moves. Uh, so the S&P, just holding at this tweezer top at the moment, We're not, uh, not seeing anything meaningful yet. To get excited, like I say, certainly want to see a close below the VWAP, 35, 34, and then I see the potential for a 34 test as the, uh, as the next logical progression on the downside. But it's going to be all about where we close as always, so uh, let's pay attention to that. Um, NASDAQ, right up into the top of its range as well, and we're starting to see the potential for pullback here. Um, and we're at extreme levels in terms of the psych indicator as well. So the, again, scope for a pullback here in terms of risk markets. Um, Arnold, gold. Okay, let's just uh, take a look at gold. Yeah, I mean, gold's in a complex, correct, what appears to be a complex correction. Um, I did mention this before. So whilst we hold um, this swing high here, whilst we hold 2013, I see... Um, 18.04 as the uh, confluent downside target. You can see 18.04 to 18.21. And we, you know, we could, it could be that we do this, you know, that we, that we retest that area. Um, but uh, where, you get, see the, where you get this sharp decline on the prior corrective move, the, it makes the, the likelihood of the next corrective move to be a bit more complex. So tougher to trade in general, um, but if you, if you can identify the key potential areas, then there are opportunities. But certainly versus this 2014, the downside objective is 1821 to 1804. Um, and then again, from there, I mean, uh, you know, gold could, uh, could once again be off to the races. So I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that this is, uh, this is you know, the end of it for gold, but certainly we're in a, what appears to be a complex correction at the moment that has uh, very confident downside objectives. That makes sense, Arnold. Okay, so those are the charts um, and the trades that I'm in and how I'm looking at the markets at the moment. I see the potential for uh, a dollar correction. And, um, and if that's going to play out, then, um, then I, again, we should see a pullback in, the, in the, some of these majors, which are ultimately going to be uh, what I think will be buying opportunities. And, um, and I, like I say, I see more dollar weakness ahead. Certainly, if you think in terms of our, our fractal pattern and where the big opportunity is, I think it's going to be the next. Once we get through this corrective period, the next leg down is going to be a meaningful, uh, a meaningful one in terms of the dollar index, to my mind. Does anyone have a chart they'd like me to take a look at that, uh, that I haven't covered or, uh, or any question about anything else I talked about today? Um, you can either type in the chat box, raise your hand or uh, type it in the Q&A, multiple options here. Um, I'll just give you, uh, just give it 30 seconds. If, uh, if you don't have a question equally, if you type an N in the chat box, that's useful for me so that I know that, uh, that everyone's understood what we've been talking about. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, like I just said, I'm long the, the dollar Swiss at the moment. Um, so let's, uh, let's quickly go back to the chart. So that's the pattern I'm looking at. But, but trust me, if we close um, back below this 90, 80 level today, then I'll be cutting that because I think we, we probably have another leg lower to go here. RSI stochastic is a bit stretched on the upside. Um, but if we can get a close above the trend line, then I see the opportunity for, uh, for a move higher. Does that make sense, Cameron? So you really want to pay attention to this, this trend line here. And certainly a close back through the VWAP at 90.70 would be, uh, would be a, a real warning sign. Any other questions? Okay, if there aren't any other questions, we will wrap this one up here and we will reconvene same time next week. Okay, thanks very much for your time and I hope that was helpful.